Life is filled with character-forming adversity, right? Are you there? Christians have aptly named these growth opportunities. <laughs> growth opportunities like marriage, like raising children, like sitting in the middle seat of a tiny car on a road trip with people that talk too much. Anybody with me? <laughs> growth opportunity. It was New Year's Eve 2005, and my friend said, hey, let's go on a road trip to my grandparents' house. They have a vacation house in Sea Ranch. Anybody been up to Sea Ranch before? Gorgeous area. Yeah, Mark knows what I'm talking about. Gorgeous area. Well, we decide to carpool, so we meet at my friend's house. We get into her car. It's this tiny car, and of course, I get the middle seat. It's just how it works. As I'm in the middle seat of this car, like any responsible college student in 2005, we get in the car, and I say, did you print a map quest? Anybody remember that? Oh, yeah. MapQuest, far superior to Google Maps and Yahoo Maps at the time. MapQuest was always right. Natalie confirms. They said, no, 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 no. We don't print MapQuests in this family. We have GPS. Now, you remember when GPS first came out? These little small Garmin GPS. Well, they didn't have one of these. She presses a button, and the screen pops up, and they have built-in GPS in this car. She types in the coordinates, and now we head on our way to this trip. Well, just like Mark mentioned, we start to drive. The fog sets in. The rain starts to come down, and we hit a detour. Well, we hit the detour. We make a right turn. Well, the GPS is now re-navigating the route. Well, as we continue on several miles down, we hit a fork in the road, and the detour says to go left. The GPS says to go right. So what does she do? She follows the GPS. As we continue down the GPS, it starts to reroute, 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 left, right turns, left, right turns. Well, eventually that small little triangle that represents our car on the screen drives off the map and into darkness. And she continues. We're like, turn around. She's like, no, the navigation system will reroute. We continue to drive. She had not downloaded a map for the area that we were in. So as we're there, we say, you have to turn around. So what do you do when, you lo when you're lost? You turn around and you go back to the last sign you've seen. So we turn around. We eventually get there. We take the detour. We arrive at this house. But you see, the navigation system had failed us. Whenever a navigation system fails you, you have to go to the back, to the last sign that gave you clarity of direction. The last two years, we've seen the navigation systems of culture fail us in many ways. The news, the government, I pray that the government was not your navigation system. But so many things, our jobs, these navigation systems failed us. And what you have to do is you have to go back to the signs, the landmarks for us as believers where God spoke those last moments of clarity. Those signs, the Bible call it, are these moments of divine intervention. In the Greek, it's this word semeon, which means this. A sign is an event or intervention by divine power. It is a miracle. So what would happen in the Old Testament is whenever a sign would take place, this miracle intervention, they would build these memorial stones or these landmark stones. And the reason why they did this is so that when their nation lost their way, they would know where they came from. And they would go back, they would see these memorial stones and remember that God had intervened and God had spoken specific words of clarity. So what do we know? We know that Jacob has one. He has this divine dream. He sets up a memorial stone in Genesis 28. We then have Joshua and Joshua 4. As they cross this Jordan River, they set up a memorial stone to remember what God had did. We see this with Samuel when they defeat the Philistines in 1 Samuel 10 to remember what God had did. I would challenge all of us here that it's time to go back to those moments when God intervened in your life. And start to ask, what is this thing that the God's asking me and leading me to do? And how did he show up in my past? How did he show up in a specific way? Because I guarantee there's unfinished business in your life if your navigation systems failed you in this season. There's unfinished business. And it's important to revisit these signs, these divine interventions. So how do they come? They come in dreams. They come in visions, they come in miracles, they come in provision, they come in these prophetic words. And there's one that really, I think we don't talk a lot about as believers because this is a principle that can be abused or taken advantage of. I believe that God speaks in signs through shut and open doors. There are shut doors and open doors. Now why we don't talk about these too often is because it's really easy for the enemy to deceive us with open doors. It's really easy. 
God's opened this door of opportunity. How many times have we seen that for friends and they step through it and their life goes into shambles? Now, shut doors are easy to discern because the door is shut. However, I've also seen friends ignore a shut door and break in through the window and still try to see their own will happen. Now, these shut doors are clear, but open doors, there is a caveat to this. And so as I've prayed through this, I really feel like this is the season of open door, but I want to bring a point of clarification on it. We were at Travis and Rebecca's house a couple weeks ago. And we were praying for the new year. And as we were praying, just saying, God, give us vision, give us clarity. I just heard the Lord say, what I open, no one can shut. And what I shut, no one can open. And the moment I heard that, I'm like, oh, that's Isaiah 22. I was so excited. You see, pastors always want a word for the year. Two years ago, 2020 was a year of clarity. Everybody knew that this was the year of uncertainty and no clarity of that year. So I was like, Lord, this is it. So I open up. It's even better. It's Isaiah 22, 22 is this verse. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. And here's my challenge today. I believe this is a year of open door for many of us. God's going to open doors, but here's how you discern if it's a God door or not. The God doors require faith and authority to walk through. Here's what's important. This verse is quoted so many times of what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. But we ignore the first part of this verse. I have given him the key of the house of David. This is implying that the Messiah has the authority to establish Israel's kingdom. See, the open doors that Yahweh wants to bring your way require authority to walk through. Matthew 28, one of the most quoted passages we have modernly is the Great Commission. We all know this verse. Go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful verse, but we often ignore the first part of the Great Commission. What does he say? All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me, therefore go. That's this word exousia, which means power. It means, it means governments by a ruling authority. But here's one other thing that authority means. It's beautiful. Exousia means absolute power. It is a warrant to open doors. Exousia power was a warrant given by a judge in the Greco-Roman world. Can you believe that? So here's what we have to understand. Is that when Jesus stands and declares, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. He is transferring authority over his, to his disciples that Ab, Adam abdicated in the garden. So he now, as a regenesis, stands up and says, I'm giving my disciples authority to go carry out my will, to carry out my power. He's given you a warrant. We all know in our culture that warrants are only granted by judges. We now have Jesus, the righteous judge, 2 Corinthians 5, that is now giving you warrants or access to take ground that was taken from you or God is asking you to possess. And we all know that in order to open a door of ground that is not ours, you need a warrant to access it. Open doors require faith and authority. When God opens doors in front of you, it should feel intimidating. It should feel overwhelming. Because that way, you know, the ground you're called to take is not in your own strength, but his. We are way too self-confident in our culture. When things happen that are miraculous, we love to take credit and to be in the spotlight of it. But God wants you to walk through doors where you know there's no way other than him that you took that ground. There's no way without his divine intervention and provision did you walk through that door. That is a God door. God doors don't feel easy. They're overwhelming. And one of the clearest open doors we see an example of this is in Numbers 13. What happens in Numbers 13? We have the nation of Israel. They're just set free from Egypt's captivity. And Moses is given a word by Yahweh. He says, I want you to go and spy out the land. So he's given this land. He says, I want you to gather these men together. So he gets these spies. Numbers 13, verse 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And said to them, go their way into the land of Negeb. Go up to the hill country and see what the land is like. And whether the people who live in the land are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land is good or bad, and whether the towns are strong or fortified. 
And whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are trees or not, but look at this, be captured, write this down. Be bold and bring some fruit of the land. Now it was the season of the first ripe grapes. I love that phrase. He says, in order to go out and spy this land, it's going to require boldness, and you have to look for fruit. See, the land, the open doors that God has you to go and take possession of or authority of requires faith to see the fruit that's in that land. I just want to say, church, it's the season of the first ripe grape. It's the season of ripe fruit. But we have to understand, whenever there's fruitfulness, there are predators that are attracted to that fruit. There's going to be opposition no matter what door you walk through. So as they give this report, they go into the land, what happens? They come back reporting, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. As a kid, I was like, that's a disgusting slip and slide. Could you imagine milk and honey on a slip and slide? No, it means cows and bees. That's what it means. It says, this is a fruitful land where there is good land to begin to plant things and take new ground in. But they said, behold, there are the descendants of Anak there, and they have strong and fortified cities. See, they bring back this report of miraculous land, but the spirit of fear creeps in to take over their faith. Remember this. They've just seen the Red Sea split in two. They've seen 10 plagues come on the people of Egypt. They've seen the spoils of Egypt now taken with them, and they're afraid of some walls. They bring back grape clusters as big as them. And yet the spirit of fear creeps in. This is how you can tell a God door versus an open door of the enemy. It requires faith greater than yourself. The spirit of fear creeps in. Verse 30. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go and occupy it at once, for we are able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, no, we are not able to go up against this people. They are stronger than us. See, there's always this opposition when a faith moment happens. This is why community is important. Who you surround yourself with will determine the path that you take. And if you're surrounded with people that have a spirit of unbelief, it will quench your spirit of faith. And the spirit of fear comes in. Chapter 14. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry. The people wept, and all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt. You had those overreacting friends. You know what I'm talking about? They just start to take over this conversation. They just brought back fruit the size of people. And the spirit of fear has made them respond irrationally. They forgot where they came from. Their navigation system failed. So what does Caleb do? He reminds them of the signs. He says, remember where Yahweh just delivered you from. Remember what Yahweh did. Verse 6, and Joshua and Caleb said, who were among you that spied the land? The land we went through was exceedingly good. Verse 8, and if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us. It flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel and do not fear these people. He implores them. And yet they say they tried to stone the spies because of their positive report. This is an overwhelming moment. It sounds like our culture in many ways. Where you know that We're called to stand in faith. We're called to take the ground that the Lord has opened up before us. But that spirit of fear, that predator is on the prowl. And the Lord is looking for people to say, will you step forward in what I've called you to do? Will you step in faith even though you don't know the way? Even though it does not seem clear because he has the key of the house of David and he's given you authority to take that land. He's given you exousia. He's given you a warrant to take access to what's in front of you. That's what this year is about. See, this whole principle of faith, one of the hallmark verses of the New Testament is found in Habakkuk chapter two. It says, the righteous shall live by faith. See, Paul makes this entire gospel is based off of this verse. We find it in Galatians chapter 3. The righteous shall live by faith. But see, the story of Habakkuk, I think, is a story of America in many ways. 
When you look at the story of Habakkuk, we have this faithful farmer that's a prophet. But his eyes are open to see the reality of what his nation has become. They're facing Babylonian rule. And we love to quote Habakkuk 2, but we skip over Habakkuk 1. I think one of the most valuable principles of intercession can be learned from Habakkuk chapter 1. Here's what we learn. Is that he recognizes that his whole community is shrinking back in fear and idolatry. But instead of reporting it on Facebook and Instagram, he takes it to the Lord. Instead of taking his complaint to his friends, instead of writing it on his social media, he goes and takes his rightful position before the Lord. What we have to understand is your authority is found in heaven, not just on earth. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And he's inviting us, these open doors that require faith, also require us to take our position of authority in heavenly places. So he goes up before the Lord, and this is what he says, back in chapter 1, verse 2. This is the message paraphrase because it's so beautifully written. How long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell, help, murder, police, before you come to the rescue? Why do you force me to look at evil, stare at trouble in the face day after day? Anarchy and violence break out, quarrels and fights all over the place. Law and order fall to pieces. Justice is a joke. Here's Habakkuk that takes an accurate assessment of the land. He says, God, I've been doing my faithful work. What are you going to do about it? Anybody ever feel like that before? With your family, at your workplace? God, I've been doing all the right things. And everything around me is crazy. It's on fire. When will you respond? Instead of giving up, instead of moving out of the state, just kidding. <laughs> I say that in love. <laughs> I'm going to get emails on that one. <laughs> this is what he does. I love this. Habakkuk 2 is the posture of intercession. He says, I will stand at my watch post. I will station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. He takes his position of authority. He says, I'm not going anywhere until you answer. For a lot of us, we get frustrated and we give up. We move on. When will this resoluteness happen in the saints? We say, I'm not going anywhere until you answer me, God. He positions his heart. He says, I will stand. I ain't moving nowhere. He enters into a position of fasting. Now, here's the problem with a lot of biblical texts. Is it moves on to the next thing. We don't know how long Habakkuk waited. I promise you, it wasn't just one sentence. He waited. He persevered. I'm not going anywhere until you speak. That's what the heart of the saints of faith are looking for, for open doors. Faith and authority. And he's met with one of the most beautiful pieces of a prophetic word you've ever heard. Verse two, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. I love what some translations say, if it seems slow. How many have ever felt the provision of God or the word of God that feels slow? My goodness. It will surely come. It will not delay. And here's the beauty. After this conversation with God, he does business with God. His heart repositions. And this is really where the Hebrew and the English don't do it justice as to what the Hebrew communicates. His response to the vision that Yahweh gives him is this. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous shall live by faith. He says, Yahweh, I acknowledge that my culture has gone crazy. But you notice the arrogance of the proud. I will choose to position my heart to live by faith as a righteous, humble man that serves you. It's time for the church to walk in a spirit of humility. Because when we enter into that place of humility, there will be power that meets us. 
God has vision. He has clarity. We have to do business with him. So for many of us, we're writing resolutions honestly in vain because they're not being written with the Lord in mind. It's time to go and sit on your watchtower, to sit in your high place and say, Lord, what's the land you've called me to take? What's the promised land that's in front of me? And the enemy wants you to see the giants. The Holy Spirit wants you to see the fruit. Because it is the season of ripe grapes. It is the season of the open door. But would you have faith to walk through it? October was one of the most difficult months of our church's history. We have tried to be faithful with our finances. We've trusted the Lord. And said, God, we recognize we've needed to get out of debt. And one of the key parts of that was our Bonita and Clinton property. It's been used as a community outreach center. It's been an amazing part of our history. But we were faced with some very difficult decisions. Escrow had fallen through three times on our Clinton property. Well, out of nowhere, as we prayed and fasted, God brought an investor and said, I would love to buy the Clinton property and rent it back to you for cost. This was an amazing provision. Well, it was unfortunate for us to hear that even with the sale of this property, we would not qualify for a long-term conventional loan. So we went to prayer. We went to fasting. As we prayed and fasted and said, Lord, what's our options here? God opened up an opportunity for a bridge loan to take place for us to keep our community center, Bonita. Now, this is why this is significant. Bonita was the first mission center of our city. Over 100 years ago, the first church of Roseville, the Methodist church, built this property right here called the Missions Chapel, which is where our Clinton and Bonita property sits today. It was designed to be an outreach center for the whole area, the whole county. And God's entrusted it to us. Well, as we prayed, as we fasted, we now got word that the closing costs to keep Bonita were going to be substantial in order to get us even into a bridge loan. This closing costs would go towards our down payment, our principal, but it was still far more than we could afford. As we prayed, as we fasted, I got a phone call from a generous family. They said, we want to pledge to cover the closing costs of the Bonita building. So as we were there, we thanked the Lord. I remember that Monday when I received that call. That next Tuesday, I wake up in my prayer journal. I'm just thanking the Lord, and I hear this exact, exact word. The provision isn't done yet. So when you get a word like that after miraculous provision, you don't want to be ungrateful. So I'm like, Lord, I don't know what to do. And he reminds me of a dream I had in 2007 about a specific provision. And so I had a phone meeting with Travis and Rebecca. I said, hey, Travis, Rebecca, I'm going to share this in confidence. I had this dream in 2007. The Lord said the provision isn't done yet. I said, well, we better be praying. So we start to pray for this provision. We're now in this place where, okay, we have the closing costs covered for the Bonita building. We now have this next phase. We have $1.2 million left in this building debt. Well, as we continued to pray and fast, I signed the closing documents on the Clinton property. Well, this mobile notary comes over to my house to sign these documents. And as we're there, we're talking. I open my door as he exits, and there's a man standing at my front door. And I said, hey, how you doing? He says, I, I felt like I was supposed to come over to your house today. I said, oh, I'm just finishing, you know, with this mobile notary. What's going on? He says, I have something for you. And he hands me these pieces of paper. He says, I have the blueprints to your original house. I said, what? He said, yeah, I was the architect to your house. These are the blueprints to your house and how your house was intended to be built. I don't know why, but I was supposed to bring these over to you today. And I'm, I'm holding the blueprints to my house, signing the property of the Clinton property, the, the closing statements. And the Lord says, I'm giving the rock the blueprints on how my house is intended to be built. You know you step into a God moment when it's right in front of you. How do you make this up? Because what this is what he says to me. The original house you're in right now was intended to be a different way, but they ran out of money on how to build it. That doesn't sound like our church at all. <laughs> but here's all the plans you need if you ever want to make modifications. So I said, okay, Lord, you're going to give us the blueprints. All this while I'm processing Habakkuk chapter 2. Okay, God, give us the vision. Make it plain on tablets. I continue to pray. He says, the provision isn't done yet. 
A week later, I get a phone call. And I'm about to say some things here that I have to say with confidence and caution. I can't compromise anything here. So I'd love to share more, but I can't. Received a phone call and they said, we've been watching your church and we've seen the faithfulness in which you stood. We recognize you're trying to get out of debt and we would like to pledge to pay off the remaining loan balance of your building so that you'll be debt free in 2022. So by the end of this month, the Rock of Roseville would be a debt-free church. We will have gone from $7 million of debt in 2018, 1 1.9 in 2019, 1 1.2 in 2021, and $0 in 2022. He's given us blueprints, church on how his house was intended to be built. This does not separate us from the church that stays standing. We are a church in the city. We are a part of many other churches. This is a prophetic statement for all the churches. He's building places of refuge, places of safety. I want to invite the elders, the financial team. I want to invite up Bud and Carol. I want to invite up Ken and Lydia Burks, the founding members of this house. We're going to take communion as we're not here yet. Get up on stage, guys. We're in the final stages of this. And I got permission from those that have pledged that we're now at a place of commitment. But there's a new era for our house. And there's a new era for your house. We will see missions funded locally and globally, not laden with debt, but provision. And every dime and dollar matters. And God has taken note. I want you to take your communion together. Ken and Lydia... Our dear friends of mine. Oh, we got some communion here. My friends, Bud and Carol. Ken and Lydia were the stewards of the Bonita property well over 20 years ago. 25 years. I'm going to give this to Mike, to Ken. In 1997, we had pastored there for 12 years, and we really felt the leading of the Lord to step out of that ministry. Uh, but in doing that, the elders and myself, we decided that we were only going to sell the building to a kingdom-minded person, somebody that would carry on the legacy that had already been going on there. And um, shortly after that, I had heard through the grapevine uh, about Francis Anfuso. I'd known him for years, uh, been part of his seminars and conferences and different things and knew the caliber of person that he was. And so when I heard that, I went and found him, sought him out, and I said, listen, we're getting ready to close the church. I hear you want to start a church in Roseville. I says, I have a building for you. And within a week or two, we were on our way to sealing that deal. But, but the, the heart of it behind all of that was is that, you know, God had already established his authority in that building. And what's happening here today is just a continuation of what he has been doing all along. I mean, people like Catherine Coleman have been there and ministered. Cho has been there and ministered. People like Bob Mumford have ministered there. It, it has a rich heritage. And I just praise God that I am still a part of that heritage, and, um, and it is living on. Amen? I love that. We're going to take communion together right now. Let's open this up. I'm going to have my brother Ken lead us in partaking the bread. Before we partake of the bread, I think it's important to remember why we're partaking of this. The bread represents the body of Jesus. It represents the healing that he procured for us. It says in Isaiah 53 that by his stripes we are healed. Matthew 18, Matthew 8 and verse 17, Jesus refers to that prophecy and he says he's come to heal all because of what Isaiah had prophesied. When Peter makes mention of that in his epistle, 
he, he no longer says, you are healed. He says, you were healed. And so today, it's not a matter of asking God to heal us. It's a matter of saying, Lord, give me the faith to believe in what you have already given me. You see, God has already given us everything that we need. He's given us healing, and now we need to be like the disciples who cried out, Lord, increase our faith. And so as we partake of this bread today that represents his body, allow faith to enter your heart. It's no longer a question of whether it's his will or not. He says he came to heal all because of what he did on the cross, because of the stripes that he bore. And so, Lord, today I pray that you give us all the faith to believe in what you have accomplished for us in the name of Jesus Christ. We partake of this bread that represents your broken body. Go ahead and partake. In Jesus, we take this in examination. We examine our hearts. We thank you for your blood that purifies us. Your blood that cleanses us. Though our sins were red as scarlet, you wash us white as snow. And Jesus, we thank you for your redemptive power, this year of the open door. We thank you, God, that your blood has made a way. You've made a way for us to enter the holy place. Jesus, we thank you that by your stripes we are healed. By your blood we are cleansed. And we rejoice over your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. We take this in remembrance of you. Thank you, Jesus. Would you grab the hand of the person next to you? We're going to sing together here in a second. I want to say thank you again to this team for leading us through this tumultuous season. You guys have sacrificed. You've led the way. I'm so grateful for your leadership. Thank you again for those in this house that have been here. This is the start of a new season, I believe, prophetically for all of us. That God wants us to lead in this way where we're not hindered by the yoke of debt. So Holy Spirit, we stand together, united, as friends and family, as brothers and sisters. We declare your divine provision for your church, for your house. Every church in Roseville and Sacramento, would you meet them and encounter them? God, I pray for any debt that families here have carried for years. That the yoke of the debtor would be released in Jesus' name. That you would teach us to be wise and faithful stewards. Lord, would you make us ten talent people? Would you make us those that can multiply that which you've given to us in both your gifts, our natural treasures? God, we choose to trust you. On the second day of the new year, we say, Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Just say that with me. Say, have your way. Have your way, Jesus. We say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Give a shout to Jesus.